1 John chapter 1. John writes, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled, concerning the word of life, the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. There are those who will say something like this. We've all heard this at one point or another. God doesn't care what you believe as long as you're sincere. There are those who will say uh, all roads lead to the same place, and it doesn't matter what road you take as long as you're sincere and follow your personal road faithfully. Now, those who disagree with this are, are referred to very often, myself included, as being narrow-minded or self-righteous, even hypocrites. And it seems to me that tolerance instead of truth is the premier virtue of our day. Now, those who believe this wouldn't apply such thinking to a pilot. If I'm taking a flight, I prefer that my pilot flies in the right direction. And those who accept God's word as truth, to those, such thinking would be foolish. You see, we can be sincere and sincerely wrong. Proverbs 14, 12 says it like this. There's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 13, that the gate is wide, the way is broad, that leads to destruction, and many are those who enter by it. So if we believe that the Bible is true, then we can't say other religious faiths are equally true. The Bible presents salvation through Jesus, and the Bible presents salvation through Jesus and no other way. In the book of Acts, chapter 4, verse 12, the apostle Peter said it like this. Peter said, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. So if what Peter wrote is true, then every other religion is false. And Romans 3, 4 says it like this, let God be true, and, but every man a liar. Now this means what we believe about Jesus is important and sincerity isn't enough. Now during the early years of the church, Satan attacked the gospel. One of the earliest attacks that came against the, the, the gospel came in what is called Gnosticism. It came in the form of Gnosticism. And uh, one of the earliest texts being that is one of the reasons that, that John writes this letter, because John is writing this letter to warn the church concerning this heresy. False teachers, Gnostics, were entering in and were infecting the church with false doctrine. Somebody said, probably the most dangerous heresy threatening the church of the first three centuries was Gnosticism. This deceptive teaching was built on the philosophical premise that all material substance is evil and that the non-material, the spirit, is good. Man was considered fallen and lost because of being imprisoned in a material body. His only hope of salvation, according to the Gnostic, was through self-knowledge. The word Gnostic comes from the Greek word gnosis, knowledge. In Gnostic teaching, man is saved not by faith in Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, dying as a substitutionary sacrifice on a cross, but by coming to know. So what were they to come to know? Well, one, they were to come to know their origin. Gnostics believed that we are a divine spark from God. They were to come to know their condition. The condition is one of ignorance and imprisonment in evil matter. And they were to come to know their destiny, a return to the original spiritual state. Now, since matter was seen as evil, a Gnostic either became an ascetic who sought to conquer the sinful desires of the flesh or a libertine, we don't use that word anymore. A libertine is one who engaged in unbridled indulgence of the flesh. So some libertines taught that the flesh could not affect the spirit. This meant you could engage in whatever act you desired without negative effects upon your real self, which is your spirit. By the way, this may sound familiar to you because Gnosticism never died. It's still with us to this day. Now, because the material body was thought to be sinful, Gnostics believed that God could not dwell in a body. 
This meant a Gnostic didn't believe in the incarnation. Some believed that Jesus only appeared to have a physical body. They were known as docetists. The word docetist comes from the Greek word dukain, and dukain means to seem or to appear. Others said that the divine Christ came upon the human Jesus at his baptism and left him immediately before his death, which is why he would say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? They took scripture out of context to present their beliefs in that way. And so this letter is written really as what it would be called an apologetic against the Gnostic heresy that was entering the church. The author of the letter is the Apostle John. The date of the letter is around 90 to 95. The readers are Christians and more than likely were those living in Ephesus in ancient Turkey. We know that John, by reading our Gospels and all, was a fisherman. And he was called by God, rather by Jesus, to be an apostle. After his resurrection, uh, God uh, inspired John to write five New Testament books. He wrote his gospel, which reveals the theme of salvation through Christ. It dealt with our past and how Jesus gave us a new life in, in him. He gave us another book, the Revelation, which deals primarily with our future. Revelation 1.19 says, write therefore what you've seen, what is now and what will take place later. And then he wrote three epistles, which were intended to encourage us in the present. You see, what Jesus did in the past prepares us for the future. John was an elder in Jerusalem. He left before Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70, settled in Ephesus, more than likely pastored there, and ministered to the seven churches of Revelation. And as is true with all letters in, in the New Testament, he had a purpose in writing. The first purpose of First John is to encourage us to joy. Notice that in verse 4, where he said, These things we write to you that your joy may be full. Christianity is a relationship with God that is joyful. Psalm 5, verse 11 Let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them that those who love your name may rejoice in you. The book of Galatians 5, verse 22 speaks of the fruit of the Spirit, and he says it is love and it is joy. The second reason that is written is to keep us from a life of sin. You see that in chapter 2, verse 1. In chapter 2, verse 1, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. So the second purpose is to keep us from a life of sin. Paul said it in this way, Romans chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may uh, increase by no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? So the second reason to keep us from a life of sin. The third reason is found in chapter 2, verse 26, which is to protect us from false teachings. He says in chapter 2, verse 26, these things I've written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. And then the fourth reason is to provide for us an assurance of salvation. And you see that in chapter 5 at verse 11. This is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. This life is in his son. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the son of God. Those are four purposes I think that right now we as believers need to experience. The joy we need to stay away from sin. We need to be safe from deception. And we need to have an assurance of, of, of God working in our lives. And so that's what we're going to be looking at. And that's what we're going to be starting now to, uh, to attempt to uh, examine. So let's begin in 1 John chapter 1, the first one. Notice how it says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which you have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. John begins with a sentence instead of an introduction. In second and third John, as well as Revelation, he began with an introduction, but here he begins with something that reminds us of other passages in the Bible. Genesis chapter one, verse one, how's it begin? Well, how's it start? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so Genesis one, one speaks of creation. His gospel started out like this in John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. 
And so Genesis 1-1 speaks of creation. John 1-1 speaks of Jesus predating creation. And so in his introduction, what he's doing is he's referring to the incarnation. Again, remember the context. The Gnostics did not believe that God would inhabit flesh. And so he's speaking concerning Jesus' incarnation. He's saying that Jesus is the living message. He's the message in human flesh. He's saying God has taken human form and has revealed himself to man. In creation, the Lord made man like himself, but in redemption, he made himself like man. And that's what he's pointing out. You see, in Jesus, the message was made alive. The word became flesh. In John 1, 14, it says the word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. And so John has given us that insight. So he's saying in verse one, that which we, speaking of John and others, have heard, that which we have comprehended, that which we have understood. So it's saying that we heard this in the past, we understood it in the past, and it has lasting consequences. It's affecting us now. We understood that message, the message of salvation that comes through Jesus Christ. And we have seen this. The word seen speaks of discerning, but beyond discernment, it speaks of discerning and experiencing. We have, dis we have discerned, we have experienced this, we have gazed closely upon, we have looked upon this. In other words, Jesus was not a phantom. Jesus was not a ghost. Jesus was a real person. He, he speaks of handling. When Jesus was resurrected, he had an actual physical body. Remember how he spoke to Mary after his resurrection, and he had said to Mary, do not cling to me. In John 20, verse 17, he said to her, don't cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but I go, but I, but go to my brethren and say to them, I'm ascending to my father, to your father, my God, and your God. When he was speaking to Thomas, and he had appeared to him, he said in John 20, verse 27, reach your finger here, look at my hands, reach your hand here, put it into my side, do not be unbelieving, but believing. There are those, and I won't give you a whole lot of this right now because it comes to mind even as I'm teaching this, but there are those who say that Jesus Christ only appeared, the Jehovah's Witnesses teach this, that Jesus Christ appeared in various bodies. He appeared as a gardener, for example, in all people, and, and they'll, they'll point that out. They say that. They say that he was not resurrected in a physical body, they, but the Bible teaches that he was. And, and that form of teaching that comes from Jehovah's Witnesses is a form of Gnosticism. That's why Jesus said, reach your finger here, look at my hands, reach your hand here, put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. You see, in light of the Gnostic heresy, his letter is based on physical reality. He's an eyewitness. God became man, and God gave man the gospel. He says in verse uh, 2, the life was manifested. We have seen. We bear witness. The word was made visible, and we've experienced this life that was given to us. And that is worth testifying about. He says it in verse 3, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you. We are witnesses, and our witness is true. Those who are preaching otherwise are liars and deceivers. And we're telling you this in order that you may know God. You take a moment with that. That's the purpose of evangelism. I really believe it's very important for us as Christians to be involved in whatever way the Lord may lead us to be a physical and material help to people. I, I believe that. When I see somebody who's in need and I have the resources or ability to help them and I sense that that's a proper thing to do at that moment, it's a right thing to do. I believe that we do that. But when you give a cup of water, Jesus said, make sure you give a cup of water in my name. And I think what happened in the church, as a matter of fact, I know what happened in the church in its, in its recent history is we became uh, enamored with a, a social gospel, with the, uh, the desire to, to minister to people's material needs, and we forgot their eternity. Um, I know somebody who is a, a minister in, in India, and he was sharing on one occasion about what he referred to as rice Christians. Rice Christians. Could have been speaking about me. Rice Christians. What was the rice Christian? He was saying they are people who claim to know Jesus because you're feeding them. But when you stop feeding them, they really don't know him. 
he said part of the problem that Western missionaries have, have brought to India is this idea that you can meet all their physical needs and they're going to, when their physical needs are met, they're going to have an awareness of their spiritual needs. He says, we don't do that in India. He says, we give them the gospel because we know that eternity is more important than having some rice right now. And uh, he, he was there and has been there for many years, and there's a lot of truth to that. We have seen over the years how, how even here in this fellowship, I've experienced it many times, when people have, have come and, and have asked for us to give them something, and very often in, in the past we have helped them. We, we will help. We do that. That's, we do that but only to be taken advantage of. Many years ago, I, uh, a lady came and she had, um, we were on Grove at that time and I had an office there and she came in, my secretary called me and said, somebody's here, they wanna to talk to you. You know, Pastor, we don't have anything. Could you be of help? It's Christmas. And, and I said, well, of, of course. And so we, we had a food pantry and we, I, I said, here, take some. We gave her some food and all. The next year she came back again. And I hadn't seen her in church, but here she comes again. This time she says, we have a need. Can you help us? And I said, of course. And so I said, here's the food pantry. Take what you need. I didn't go in there with her. So I went in after she left, and there was nothing left in the food pantry. She took every single thing. And the Christmas tree that we had in the, in the sanctuary that we had there, that was to remember uh, as a remembrance of the season that we we're in. So I learned kind of early in ministry that feeding somebody isn't saving somebody. And we have to be aware of those kinds of things. We have to be aware that there's a need for them to know Jesus Christ. We need to tell people about him. In John 17, verse 3, this is life eternal, that they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And so he goes on, and now he gives to us the first purpose. He says in verse 4, These things we write to you, that your joy may be full. I want to develop that with you for a few moments. Joy. The Bible in the New Testament was written in what is called Koine or Common Greek. And the Greek word at that time that was chosen to be used, that we translate as the word joy, is the word kara. And kara is a word that can be used for a variety of things, including charismatic gifts and various things like that. It speak of grace and all. But kara speaks of delight and cheerfulness. It, it, it's something that reminds us of how good it is for us to be saved. I mean, I, I don't know how many people uh, spend much time, perhaps all of us in this room do, I don't know, perhaps not, how many believers spend any time remembering, not with the desire to go back, but remembering where you came from, remembering the life you used to live, remembering your own testimony. Again, remember, I've shared with you that, that we have testimonies. Usually there are two. We have the one that's appropriate to share with others, and everybody knows it, and then we have the real one that only God and I know. And that real one isn't something I like to share with anybody. As a matter of fact, only God knows these things. I've been with my wife for many, many years now. She doesn't know my full testimony because she wouldn't be my wife for many, many years. But God changes you, right? God, God does a work in you. God, God forgives you. God transforms you. God makes you unrecognizable to those who knew you best. He changes you. And when you consider that, when you think of what you were, where you were going, what you were doing, how miserable your life was, and then somebody loved you enough to come and speak to you and tell you about Jesus Christ. When somebody told you, you are most miserable and you need the Lord. It's kind of like, that's how Charles Spurgeon got saved. Charles Spurgeon, the great British preacher of another age. Charles Spurgeon was 17 or so years old. He was in a small church in England and the pastor couldn't make it because it was stormy. And so here comes this deacon in the church. He didn't know how to preach very well, but he pointed his finger at a young Charles Spurgeon and he said, young man, you're most miserable. He said, but you will be more miserable in hell if you don't give your heart to Jesus Christ. And that's, that's a different day. That's a different form of preaching. But that's what brought Charles Spurgeon to the faith of Christ is somebody was willing to tell him you're miserable and you need joy. Joy 
is a spiritual reality. It's not happiness. happiness. The word happiness derives its origin from the word happenings. So my happiness depends on my circumstances. So if things are going well right now, I'm happy. If everything's going well, my, my, my life seems to be in order. It's going well. When I first got out of the military, I had a guy who I, I, I worked for. I was hired to work for him. He wanted somebody from Biola to work for him. He liked to have Christians, though he himself was not a Christian. But he liked to have Christians work for him. And so I went to work for this guy. And uh, he was a most miserable man, I have to tell you. He wasn't that old. He's in his 30s. He had two small young children, two boys. And he, 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 I, I, I discovered as I worked for him that part of the reason that he liked to bring in Biolans is he wanted to debate he wanted to speak about what he believed was truth, and he wanted to argue with Bible college students. And so that's part of why he hired me. And he would get kind of smart, kind of flippant. He'd make comments, you know, and, and I, I was there to work a job, not to argue with the boss. But eventually, I went into his office after work, and I started visiting with him. And I told him, you need the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, why? He said, I'm very happy right now. I said, you're happy because your business is doing well. You're happy because your wife has been faithful to you. And you're happy because your children are small and they're not causing you any problems. <laughs> but what's going to happen if your business goes down the tube? What's going to happen if your wife is unfaithful to you? What's going to happen if your children... Don't turn out the way you want them to. What are you going to have then? Are you going to be happy? And he, I said, you, you, you don't, happiness isn't what I'm looking for. What I have is the joy of the Lord. And the joy of the Lord comes through salvation. With the joy of the Lord, even though today may not be a good thing, there's something waiting for me that's a whole lot better. And so my focus isn't on the right now. My focus is on my future in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I, I've been asked, I've said this to you before, but I've been asked, what is the number one lesson you have learned over the 50 plus years you've walked with the Lord? And it's this, it all works out in the end. What was bothering me then has a tendency of being solved over time. And the things that I thought would never be solved, they are solved. And often they've been solved in a way that I, that I end up being rejoicing, rejoicing in the Lord because of what he has done. So joy comes from salvation. Happiness comes from circumstances. And so we write these things to you that you may have joy. In Isaiah chapter 12, verse 3, it reads, With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Psalm 16, verse 11, You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Jesus said in John 15, verse 11, I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Romans chapter 4, verse 8, Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will never count against him. Blessed speaks of being joyful, rejoicing. Why? My sins will not be counted against me. We write these things so your joy may be full. We write these things so that you may know this message that we're giving to you came to life. We saw him. We handled him. We know who he is. He's the word of life. And he has brought to us salvation. And this salvation produces joy. If you follow false teaching, it always ends up in misery because you're miserable because you can't be what that master is telling you you ought to be. But in Christ, he makes us what he wants us to be. Verse 5, he says, this is the message which we've heard from him and declare to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. His word is not in us. This is the message, verse 5. And we're declaring it to you. 
We're speaking of God's nature and we're speaking of God's character. And in him is light. In him is light. There is no darkness in him at all. God's nature and character is revealed through Jesus. And throughout the Bible, light is symbolic of good and darkness is symbolic of evil. In Job 30, verse 26, when I hoped for good, evil came. When I looked for light, then came darkness. So without Jesus revealing God to us, we wouldn't have discovered him on our own. It had to be revealed. Again, in Job, Zophar, the Namathite, said this. In Job 11, 7 through 9, can you fathom the mysteries of God? Can you probe the limits of the Almighty? They're higher than the heavens. What can you do? They're deeper than the depths of the grave. What can you know? Their measure is longer than the earth, wider than the sea. In Romans eleven thirty three, O oh, the depth and the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. One of the problems with those who don't know the Lord is they have a tendency of making him into a man, not in the incarnation, but reducing him to be like a human being. And they think that they can think, outthink God or out argue God. And they just have no concept of the magnitude of God. How, how could they? They don't know him. They're walking in darkness. They have no light within them. Because God has a depth that no one can plumb. God is much beyond our finding out. We can't hunt for him and, and find him through natural means. <laughs> As a matter of fact, man isn't even naturally seeking after him. Romans 3.11 says, there's none who understands. There's none who seeks after God. So that's why Jesus came, to reveal God the Father to us. In Matthew 11.27, all things have been delivered to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and he to whom the Son wills to reveal him. So we all need the revelation through the power of the Holy Spirit, the conviction through the word of God to know who Jesus Christ is. And God is the one who draws us. The Bible teaches us that God is holy and God is righteous, that he is separate from sinners. Again, in Job 37, 23, the almighty is beyond our reach. He is exalted in power in his justice and great righteousness. He does not oppress. God is holy and God is righteous. And because he is, his children are to be also. In 1 Peter 1, 14 through 16, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. You see this attitude that I can do whatever I want with my body um, that the Gnostics have, you know, and still go to heaven and all of that has bled into the church. I can tell you over the years, conversations that I've had with people who who like to who like to defend a life that they know is not pleasing to God by using the words well I'm saved by grace and what we do is we take the grace of God and we kind of extend it like a blanket over us that gives us permission to continue in sin but shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound God forbid Paul had said and so the Gnostics were saying, you can do what you want with your body. It really doesn't matter. But, but John is making it very clear. No, it is. It really does matter. God is holy, and God intends us to live holy lives also. First uh, Peter 1, 14 through 16, again, as obedient. Children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. It's written, be holy because I am holy. So... With this in mind, John gives three tests for Christians or professing Christians. And notice this. You're going to see it in verse 6, 8, and 10. Each test begins with the words, if we say. Well, verse 6 contrasts a profession of faith with our actions. Verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. If we say that we know him, but habitually live in a sinful lifestyle, we're not telling the truth. If we say we have fellowship with him, that word fellowship speaks of an intimacy, a knowledge of God. So if we have an intimacy with God, but are living habitually in sin, we're not practicing the truth. Again, Gnostics believe they could sin with impunity. 
So the walk in darkness speaks of a way of life, a habitual lifestyle, an expression of a life. He's saying if you continue in sin, you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I, 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 I should say this very quickly. You get saved. Does that mean that from that point on, it's just a straight climb up? And, you know, a month later, you're almost Billy Graham, you know, and in 10 years, you're the most amazing. No, uh, because of our flesh and no giving, <laughs> giving no excuse for it, but taking into consideration the reality of it. No, we don't necessarily have a, have a, a stupendous climb up to the top at all, right? I mean, we go through what is called the process of sanctification where, where we walk with the Lord, we fail, we confess our sin, God forgives us. We start our walk again, and, and many walks are, are like that for some time until you finally get it going. And it's not that you ever stop sinning because we never stop sinning until we're face-to-face -face with Christ. And um, that's just life. It's just a process of growing more like Jesus Christ, being conformed into his image. But then there are others, and I've encountered, and perhaps some of you have, and maybe, maybe some you know are doing this right now. You may be doing this right now who... Who use, who use grace as an excuse to continue in sin. I've seen that more than once. Who use God's grace as an excuse. Many years ago, a young lady came into my office. She said, Pastor David, can I, would you pray for me? And I said, well, of course. But how can I pray for you? And she said, I would like you to pray. She was in high school. She said, I would like you to pray for a, 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 a boy that I've got a crush on in school. And I said, really? Now, I'm not a mystical matchmaker. That's not my thing, you know. But she went to our fellowship at that time, and, and I'm, I was, a, a, I, I supposed her pastor. So I said, let me ask you a question. I said, of course, I'll pray for you, but let me ask you a question. She says, what is it? I said, this, this young boy that you, that you like. She goes, yeah. I said, is he a believer? Is he Christian? Oh, no. I said, you want me to pray that God will give you an unbeliever as a boyfriend? She goes, yeah. I said, where did you get the idea that I should do that? She said, well, I was reading the Bible, and Jesus said, whatever you ask in my name, I will do. <laughs> so we had a nice conversation about that. I never saw her again. I, I wonder why. I said, no, girl. I said, no, because um, you're not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. God forbids that. And I shared with her what the scripture says about relationships, and you're making a mistake, and no, God isn't going to answer that prayer. That's out of his will. But she had just, oh, no, God will give me what I want. There are quite a number of people who are that way. And so if we say that we have fellowship with him, but our life doesn't demonstrate that habitually, we walk in darkness, he says in verse 6. He says, we lie and don't practice the truth. You see, obedience to the things of the Lord in your life is proof of your salvation. Remember John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. In John 14, 23 and 24, if anyone loves me, he'll obey my teaching. My father will love him. We will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. Evidence that I know the Lord is a desire to be obedient to him. That's the first test. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Verse 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And so, true Christian fellowship is built on lives that are obedient. When we live in disobedience, we have no true fellowship with others. When we're practicing a life of sin, fellowship is cut off. And some of you understand what I just said, because you may have a friend who, who professes to know the Lord, but because they're living in a way that isn't, isn't uh, glorifying to the Lord, and, and you desire to, it cuts the fellowship off. Marie and I have a very dear friend, and uh, when we were dating, uh, he's a guy, because I told him, I, I, I told him, I said, uh, I had been going out with Marie for like 
four or five months. And I told him, I said, I've never, ki I haven't kissed her. And my friend looks at me and he says, well, what? You haven't what? I said, I haven't kissed her. It took three months for me to hold her hand. I'm hard to get. No, I said, I just, <laughs> I said, no, I haven't done it. It was my friend who said, you know, David, you really care about her. Maybe you ought to give her a kiss and this and that. It was my friend. And he's very dear to me, very dear to me. When I got married, when Marie and I got married, there were only two people in my wedding. There was my brother and there was my friend. I mean, that's how close he was to me. But my friend went through a, a period where he just, he just wasn't walking with the Lord. I, I didn't want to be his judge because I loved him. And that's when I began to learn a concept that I've had for all of these years, and it was this. Sometimes friendships turn into ministries. Sometimes friendships turn into ministries. Friends are, are people who, who um, put shoulder to shoulder looking to the future together. We have the same vision going in the same direction. But sometimes that friend of yours may be looking in a direction you can't go to. And when they begin to look in those directions, that's when they cease being the friend you had. They become the ministry you have. And so when Marie and I would see my friend, when we'd drive over to his place to see him, we'd pull over, and she may remember this. It's been a long time, but I would pray. And I'd say, Father, I'm, I love this brother. I love him. But help me to be a minister to him and to encourage him to walk with Jesus. He's walking with the Lord now, has for many years, and he came back and, and all of that. But you have to determine uh, who's influencing who. And you have to be aware of those kinds of things. You see, when we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. It's built, fellowship is built on walking in the light. And darkness is a, is a life of living in disobedience. In verse 8, he goes on, and yes, I think I will finish this today. Uh, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if we say we have no sin, if, if we say that we have no sin nature, if we deny personal sin, if I deny personal guilt, if I don't understand that I have a nature that is sinful, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm deceived. The Bible in Psalm 51.5 says it like this, surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. In Romans 5.12, therefore just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, in this way death came to all men because all sinned. We inherited what is called the Adamic nature. We don't become sinners because we sin. We sin because by nature we are sinners. Mormons teach you that you become a sinner when you sin. The Bible teaches you that you sin because by nature you are already a sinner. We saw this in Ephesians 2, verse 3, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. And so if we say we have no sin, verse 8 tells us, we deceive ourselves, the truth's not in us, we're guilty of believing what we want to believe. But, verse 9, if we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I like to say this, the word all means that. All unrighteousness. When I, and when you, when you bowed your heart to the Lord and said, God, forgive me a sinner. He didn't forgive me just for the sins I had committed up to that moment of prayer. He, can, he, he forgave me of all the sins that I would commit even after I had given my heart to him. His grace is, is, that, is that enormous. It, it's not permission to continue in sin. We've already looked at that. But it's the reality of the, of the power of the, the cleansing of the blood of Christ and the grace of God. And what we need to do, and I think this is very important as believers, is I think we need to understand, and I already emphasized this in Ephesians, that we need to know who we are in Jesus Christ. You know, I, I need to know what, what God has said of me, who I am in him. I've been made the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. 
My name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. All of my sins have been forgiven. I need to know these things and to live in those things. So if I confess my sin, God is faithful to his promises and God forgives us. Proverbs 28, 13, he who conceals his sins does not prosper. Whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy. God is just. His promise of mercy and forgiveness is in line with his justice. And then finally, verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My mom was my mom was a real evangelist. She just loved to talk to people about the Lord. I've shared this with you. Some of you have heard this in the past. But my mom was my mom was very, very open with her faith. And and she had physical conditions. Ultimately, she 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 died because of them. But she went to a, a doctor. I'll, I'll always remember this. She went to a doctor in Kaiser in Fontana. And she um the doctor took out her stethoscope and put the stethoscope on my mom's heart. And she had just met my mom. My mom didn't know this woman from Eve. I mean, she she didn't know her. So the, the doctor puts the stethoscope on her heart and says to her, my mom says to her, do you hear him? That's kind of a creepy thing. <laughs> and my mom told me about it. She says, so I asked her, do you hear him? And she looks, my mom says, she stepped back and looked at me. She said, do I hear who? Do you hear him? Who? Do you hear Jesus? He lives in my heart. And so the, the, the doctor said, oh, how sweet. She says, and she looked at my mom's chart, a doctor at Kaiser, and she said, Rosales, do you have a son named David? And my mama says, yes. I have my husband. I'm, I can't. It's been so many years. It's been over fifty years since I was. I knew this guy, but my husband, your son in the army, led my husband to faith in Jesus Christ. And she said to my mom, "Tell your son that my husband is doing well and is walking with Jesus Christ." And so am I, you know, but it's, it's, it, yeah, amen, amen. And so that's what the Lord does. And, and if we claim that we have no sin, we make God a liar because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So to claim to be perfect uh, is not part of our life today. No one is sinlessly perfect. And so he's saying it. If these people say they have no sins and all of that, God's word isn't in them. Because Christianity is built on man's sinfulness and need for a savior. His word is not in us, he says, because God's word makes it clear. We are sinners within, with, uh, without Christ. Proverbs 20, verse 9. Who can say I've made my heart clean? I'm pure from my sin. Ecclesiastes seven twenty. There is not a righteous man on earth who does what is right and never sins. My mom tried to lead a woman to Christ and shares the gospel with her and and the woman says, my mom would say, do you want Jesus? And the woman said, I, I do. And my mom says to her, okay, bow your head and pray with me. And so the woman bows her head. And my mom says, dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. And the woman says to my mom, wait a minute. She opened her eyes. I'm not a sinner. And that's the attitude. I'm not a sinner. And if somebody says they, they have no sin, they make him a liar. No, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's not something to boast in. That's just a reality of life. That's why I need a savior. That's why I needed Jesus Christ. I had somebody say one time, oh, you need a crutch. You know, I don't need a crutch. What I need is someone to carry me completely. A crutch means I can still walk. I can't walk. That's why Jesus gave to me something that he could carry me in. It's called his grace. Yeah, I, you know, I, I needed that. Because I'm not going to pretend that I'm better than I am. I know I'm evil. And I know that without Jesus Christ, I would still be evil. But because of Jesus, he transformed my life. So no, I'm not perfect. Marie thinks I am, but I'm not. I'm not perfect. None of us are. All of us still fail. Why? Because we're still here. But one of these days, and it's not that long, we'll see him face to face. And there is no sin in heaven. We'll just have joy. 
And so we begin, first, these things I've written unto you so that you may have joy. And that joy that you have is because Christ has forgiven you of all your sin. He's, he's promised you eternity with him. And that causes me, that gives me strength to get up in the morning, is the knowledge that, that Jesus Christ is in control of everything. And I, what I want to do is just be on the same page with him. And so there, there's your introduction to First John. We'll continue next week. Amen.